It is my privilege to introduce our keynote speaker, Brian Dunbar. Uh, Brian is executive director of the Institute for the Built Environment and Professor Emeritus at Colorado State University. Professor Dunbar holds two degrees in architecture from the University of Michigan and is a lead accredited professional. He has taught interior design, construction management, and sustainability courses at CSU and created the graduate emphasis in sustainable building. Uh, he holds professional certificate courses in green building and sustainable design and construction courses. Uh, Brian has guided project work and facilitated de design charrettes for many organizations and governments across the country. And Brian is co-author of 147 tips on teaching sustainability. And his sustainable building teaching and research has been honored and recognized by, I'm not sure what AIA is, but must, uh, the United States Green Building Council chapter and by the Colorado governor. So with that, let me turn this over to Brian Dunbar. Thank you all very much. Uh, thanks, Steve, I appreciate that. Uh, that AIA thing, that those of you that are architects know, it's the American Institute of Architects, but I gotta put in a plug for those since it was mentioned. Um, I'm a pinch hitter today, and I'm really happy to be here. Uh, pinch hitters can play a, a good, important role. Sometimes they can win the game and that sort of thing uh, if, they, if the manager calls on the right one. So I hope I can hit a home run for you uh, today with, <clears throat> with some thoughts. And um, I want to start out by saying it's an honor to be here, an honor to be uh, part of this group, and, and I always feel that it's an honor to be a citizen of Fort Collins. Uh, I travel a lot and I get to kind of spread the word about green schools and green buildings uh, to a lot of other places, but I'm always happy to be coming home because we have a great place. I, you, you know that, I think, but I just wanted to uh, start us out with that thought that uh, we are in a great and, and unique place. So here's what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna take you through um, kind of a story and this story is going to um, have three parts to it. It's going to start talking about things that are hot, flat, and crowded. I don't know if you've read. Anybody read that book? Raise your hand if you have. And, uh, and then I want to, chapter two is going to be cool and green. And then chapter three is going to be biomimetic and generous. OK, so you can see we're going to make some progress in this little bit of time we're together. So starting with the hot stuff, um, you know, in business, when we say we have a hot item, that usually is a good thing. We're, we're on to, we, we need to sell more of them, we need to make more of them. Um, but by the end of my talk today, I want to talk about how you could make things that are hot sellers, but maybe they're not so hot on the planet. Maybe they really fit in with nature and its principles. I'm going to be saying that a few times. I'm going to talk about nature and its principles today. So when we talk about the hot stuff, uh, Thomas Friedman in his book, Hot, Flat, and Crowded, has a lot of emphasis and a lot of facts, a lot of data on the research that's out there uh, on how carbon has changed over time. Now, when I say that, hot, flat, and crowded, for the 90% of you that haven't read that, it sounds terrible, right? Hot, flat, and crowded. It's actually not a terrible book, and it actually leaves you with hope. And I hope to do the same thing with you uh, today as well, that there, we have problems, but we can address them with good energy and figure out where to go with this. That's the, the message. But we do have problems. If you look at the red line there, I mean, that's talking about uh, carbon emissions. It's hard for you to see. Um, that's 1951, kind of in the middle and our carbon uh, emissions have risen dramatically in the last uh, 60 years. And that's led to, many people would say, a corresponding rise in global temperature averages. And you can kind of see how things spike, and yeah, you know, there's, there's days that are cold, and there's days that are warm, and there's years that are warmer, but when we put it all into climate and studies, we see a correlation between a lot of carbon rise and a lot of temperature rise, and 
You know, the, the quote at the bottom there, all uh, the 10 hottest years are between 1996 and 2011, will soon be able to say, and the hottest was, right, 2012. Not just in Fort Collins, but most places in at least the United States and, and North America, if not other places in the country. So, so that's the hot part. I'm not going to dwell on it, but I want to say it's, it's an issue. The flat part, you can see these are quick cliff notes. I'm already on to the you know, middle part of the book. The flat part is we're consuming a lot in our country, and a lot of people want to be like us. So what if most of the world would consume the way we do? It's not going to work. It can't work. Um, so we're talking about populations that are rising, but that gets to the, the crowded part, hot, flat, and crowded. Right now the flat part is that we are consuming at a higher level than other countries, and they, other countries want to be like us. And so it's, that's flattening the world out. You might have read Friedman's other book, The World is Flat. He was getting more about, uh, on about that. Have you seen this, though? OK, here's a little bit, a uh, little humor in the midst of this kind of a little depressing start to a lecture. Uh, life satisfaction. Are you happy? Uh, are we the happiest? I would think we're probably up there, right? Uh, we're one of the happier countries, I would guess. Anybody know who the happiest country is? Denmark's up there on a lot of scales. Any, Bali, I, Finland, Costa Rica. I'm going to say that you're number one, at least on this study, of uh, the happiest countries. And uh, there's Denmark and Norway and Ireland and Canada and Finland. So you you had some good answers, and we're about to show up. Okay, so we're we're up there. You know, there's a lot of countries in the world, and we're close to the top as far as life satisfaction. And you can see, on the other hand, you could look at Africa and say, now, there's a lot of people that are dealing with very tough issues and a lot of survival issues. And they, are, they have a low letter, level of life satisfaction in many places in Africa. OK, now, consumption. As you can quickly make out, dark means you're consuming a lot. We're alone. We are, we're winning. <laughs> we're way up there. But this is the point, you know, others want to be like us. And Friedman says, hey, if others want to be like us and we kind of know inherently that we should consume differently or less, maybe we could be role models in the next industrial revolution. Let's do things differently and let's show how they can be done consuming with a better ecological footprint, or even a positive ecological footprint, if that's possible. Well, so this leads us to the Happy Planet map. Maybe you've seen this before. But it takes that first one I showed you, the happiest countries, and divides it by the biggest consumers. So as you can imagine, uh, we're fairly happy. We're quite happy. And we're huge consumers. So that doesn't work out so good when you get to the happy planet. We're, we're as a, according to the happy planet, we're down there. We're, we're, we're not doing that well. Guess who's doing great? Costa Rica is still number one. And here's a quick story. I, I have a chance to teach in Costa Rica from time to time. Our university has a nice connection with the University of Costa Rica. And our students and their students come together. And, and there's, there's professionals down there that really want to learn more about green buildings. So I've had a chance to go down there. And Anyway, two of their students have come to our campus to be graduate students uh, at, at Colorado State. And when I get to this, I say, Rodrigo, wh why? What, what's going on here? And he said, well, and he kind of looked around the room of students and said, well, I, I hate to say this, but um, we're a lot less materialistic in our country than what I've observed in my two years in, 
in the United States. I think we spend more time on relationships than we do on, on getting stuff. It's real, that's what Rodrigo said, and, and Roberto is kind of like, yeah, what he said. So, so I, I give you a real life story of you know, how it, what that means to a Tico or a few Ticos in, in Costa Rica. Take that for what it's worth. Okay, hot, flat, and crowded. Um, I'm not going to dwell on the crowded part. You know, we're getting to more and more people. Or you know, uh, the, the numbers are pretty staggering when you think about how quickly we double our population again and move on. Just a quick quote out of the book, you know, talking about India. And there's a, a good reason to talk about India, both for how quickly it's growing, how many people are there, and again, the flat part of his story, how, how, how quickly we're talking about uh, another billions of people that want to be more like us and that consumption. Okay, this isn't really that fun to talk about, and it's probably not that really f that fun to digest. You're enjoying some, some good food. Digest that, but I really just needed to start out with the, the hot, flat, and crowded for to make, to make the point. All right, so I'm done with that. All right, I'm done with chapter one of the talk, Hot, Flat, and Crowded. Read the book. By the end, like I said, it'll make, it not only makes sense, a lot of facts, a lot of good points, and uh, hope, actually hope. But let's go on to the, the cool and green part of the talk. That feels a little bit better. And then we'll get to, to the part three. I dedicate this part to uh, a good friend, De Greg Franta. Some of you may know or know of Greg. He was, uh, he was my inspiration for doing what I do. Uh, my career went through a, a big change to go into sustainability after Greg planted a seed in me uh, back in the uh, mid-90s. Unfortunately, Greg uh, was in a car accident uh, outside of Boulder uh, a couple years ago. But Greg meant so much to so many of us around the world uh, as a leader that the story I'll plant in you right now is that Nancy Clanton, someone else that has done a lot for our city and speaks to us, uh, a great lighting designer and, and daylighting designer, was uh, Greg's best friend. And Nancy said at the eulogy that Greg has actually cooled the planet in his work. And she said he worked on over 800 buildings that without his touch would have been contributing more emissions to the planet. They would have been warmer buildings. They would have had more, more molecules of emission. And Greg cooled them. So she said he made a definitive difference. But his work isn't done. And she said to the audience of, of 600 of us uh, at his memorial, his work needs to continue and we need to do it. And I just grabbed onto that. And so here I am telling you, and I've told a number of other audiences the same thing, that here's a guy who meant a lot to me, did a lot for the planet, but was only just begun in his work. And so many of us are continuing uh, Greg's work. For instance, I just got to tour one of Greg's buildings on uh, Monday. I was in Little Rock doing a Green Schools uh, talk. And this building, this wonderful complex of buildings, is uh, a, a building that Greg had a hand in. He did the daylighting work for the Heifer International Project, Lead Platinum. There are so many great aspects of that. Um, I, my, it was my first time to Little Rock. I don't know if, if you ever get a chance to go there. Take the time. It's right across the street from the Clinton Library, which is also a Lead Platinum building and, and we're seeing. But this one caught my attention, and I think partly because of Greg's ha having a hand in it. But the materials there, the views, the water, the way they treated it, the materials, the education that you get, the facility manager who's been there now se uh, seven years is like, it's a great building. And I don't hear facility managers often say, this is a great building. Sometimes they say exactly the opposite. But uh, he was into it. He's like, no, it's not perfect. There are some things that we have to keep tweaking. but. You know, it's performing well in terms of energy and water, and people like it, and they don't, they like their work, and, and there's some great spaces uh, to, to accomplish things in. So here's a building that Greg had a hand in that is uh, working to help cool the planet. 
But we're doing some great things around our town as well. Back to, I love living here. Uh, Greg's firm actually had a hand in uh, the first green schools uh, in our city. And I am proud to tell you that the Pooter School District is a leader nationally when it comes to uh, the school environments that they are creating for teaching and learning. And this is a great example. You know, RB plus B, the architects in town, uh, worked, this was their third generation classroom. And I have to say that um, Corky and, and George and the others that worked on this got it right. The teachers don't turn the lights on most days in Canard because of how it was designed. And so it's not just bright by the windows, but they figured out by putting some solo tubes and, and some other things in it that, and the way they treated the paint and the reflections and the, and the angle to the ceiling and all of those the colors and things. It's beautiful. And there aren't that many classrooms in the world as good as that one. And so I've spread the news to others that, hey, you could do this too. Um, so that's helping to cool uh, the planet. But there's some other great things going on in the world that are also cooling the planet. I don't know if you've heard of Curitiba, but here's a place that years ago decided, let's, we have a lot of urban sprawl, but let's really focus ourselves back into our city. And to do that, we really have to look at transportation. And we have to make it a place that's safe and a place that people want to come to. I think we do that in our town in a smaller way, but I know I go to other places and people say, I've been to Fort Collins, oh, that old town is great. And that's like the first thing that comes out of people's mouth. Well, they mention the beer too, but they, they mention it. Uh, so preserve the history, uh, and, and then they do some great social things as part of it. So the, the transportation that they have is, is great. Uh, and they figure that out and they become a role model for others in terms of transportation. But what they've done with their parks and what they've done with replanting, which goes to me when you replant something, you're going beyond sustainability. Uh, the recycling that they have, the way they are, look at that one at the bottom. For every bag of trash collected, a bag of groceries is given. So they're doing some great social uh, things, some social and environmental things. So. So I, I want to say we have to look outside sometimes, see what's going on around the world, and get ideas from there. And I, I think we do a good job as a city uh, of doing that. Another green, cool, cool and green idea is renewable energies. And I think you know, in northern Colorado, we've done a nice job with, with uh, emphasizing uh, wind and wind power and having programs that allow businesses and individuals to become part of it subscribe to it, and as I drive through Wyoming, uh, I love seeing the amount of turbines in Wyoming, and someone recently told me that's only a tenth of what you're going to see uh, in the future, that they have a big, really big master plan, which, which is real encouraging. Although, then I read in the paper that, you know, we're, now we're starting to lose jobs with wind energy because some of the uh, tax advantages and other things have, uh, are going away. Uh, so we're not stimulating that. Friedman would, will warn you, if you read Friedman, he says, we have to stimulate some of this stuff to get it going so that we could have more advantage over time to really become that leader. And you hear today in the paper about solar, um, you know, those kinds of things. You dig into why that's happened, and Friedman would say uh, those advantages could have come sooner to us, and instead, China, Denmark, Germany, some places that are pretty cloudy uh, are ahead of us in terms of uh, the technologies for, for solar development and other kinds of renewable energy because they have emphasized it. Again, that can be a little depressing to think about and, and it's important for us to pause and consider what to do about that in the future. Uh, but, if, but I think clean energy, the leadership role that we can and should play uh, those two things need to go together. And so we can talk about cool green ideas that we are doing and we're proud that we're doing, and I'd like to see us doing more and more, have more emphasis on that. Because we know that clean energy is safe, and we know that other forms of energy can be problematic. Now, all forms of energy and, and use and movement can cause some problems, but 
You remember this time, this was only, what, two and a half years ago when we had the BP oil spill. And you know, we, we can blame a company or we can think about society and what we're asking for and what we have decided we need. And in terms of energy and the needs that we have, how can we meet more of those in clean and safe and cool ways? That's really what I, the thought I want to leave for you with that. And there are people who are uh, design, having ideas for, now this isn't built, this is uh, someone's idea, but wouldn't it be great if we're driving down the road and all of a sudden that's helping to create energy by, by that. And some people are talking about doing the same kind of thing with, with airplanes, ca catching some of the, the breeze and turning that into energy. So what are those ideas? Where are those out there? Let's encourage those. And then the smaller ideas, but are really big when you, come, when you go to Pine Ridge Reservation. Fort Collins has a hand in this, thanks to trees, water, people, and village earth. They've really been supporting the expansion of solar energy. First, we gave them some solar panels, and we showed them how to use them. And then we helped them create the Henry Red Cloud Renewable Energy Center, where they're actually learning how to make them. They're making them, and they're installing them, and they're seeing how well they're working. So it may sound, look and sound like a little idea, but that's a big, cool, green idea when it comes to that reservation. Other thing, trees, water, and people involved in uh, Central America doing things with uh, efficient stoves, a really healthy thing. They found an unhealthy situation, and they created uh, a lot of health uh, particularly for the women who are creating the food for their families in unhealthy, awful indoor air quality places. Mm -hmm. And by giving them cook stoves, you know, we've had our CSU uh, Energy and Engines Conversion Lab help out with cook stoves, and Trees, Water, and People are doing some hands-on there, both with the, those cook stoves and some other ones that they've created. So another cool green idea, helping the world and something that has a, a basis uh, with all of us in Fort Collins. Okay, so I'm moving along. I gave you some depressing things with the hot, flat, and crowded, but I encourage you to pause, think about it. It's real, and it, we need to deal with it. And we can, and if we do, good things can happen. Cool and green, I gave you some, some things there, but now let's go on to what I was really brought here for. Uh, uh, so Marie Zanowick is uh, with the EPA. She was supposed to be the speaker, and she has been trained in biomimicry. And so uh, I've, I've, I speak about biomimicry. I really believe in it. I think it's, it's, it's like the way, a different way to think about the future. And so uh, I know Marie and, and took on some of her uh, information and knowledge and brought together some other things to show you um, that our future while we were dealing with hot, flat, and crowded issues, and we have figured out how to be cooler and greener, that maybe that's not enough, and that we can go to higher forms. Like, what's next? That's really what the rest of this talk is about. And for me, coming from the built environment, here's one of the things that's next for me. There's a, you know, I'm, I'm way into lead, and, and I, with our projects that we uh, help with, with the, at the Institute for the Built Environment at CSU, we help projects get LEED certified, and it really is great. We get to hire students, they learn about LEED. Uh, we're part of uh, the architecture teams, the construction teams. Uh, we document the LEED work. Our students are learning a lot. It's great to see them being, and like telling the contractor, hey, are you done with your calculation yet? Have you figured that out yet? Do you need some help? Can I help you with that? And then we compile it and we get it, help get it certified. It's a great thing, and we push it to higher levels. You know, LEED has different levels, and we're pushing toward gold and platinum with all of our projects, so it's great. And LEED is gonna continue to evolve to higher and higher forms and, and really push the standards higher and higher. There's another system out there called the Living Building Challenge. There's only a couple projects in the world that have been Living Building Challenge certified, and here's one of them. Here is a place that you can go to learn to uh, live and, and exist sustainably, particularly with water and food production and plant growth, and then education. It's a retreat center uh, and a, a research place. Uh, and you can see they're doing a number of things with wastewater. So you're actually looking, that, uh, that 
wood faced building with all the glass, that is a wastewater filtration facility. You ever see a wastewater filtration facility look like that? I mean, it's one you go in and you actually would want to go in and you can learn while you're in there and you don't want to just turn around and walk out because it smells too bad. I mean, there's different smells, but, but it's, it's like part of the ecology uh, and, and it really is handled in a, in a humane way for us to really gain an understanding of the processes of how you can take something that is waste and turn it into something that is, again, clean. You know, waste equals food or waste equals clean water if you take it through the right biological processes. And that's what's taught in that facility. So it's using nature's principles and causing us to think about what those are. There's some great organizations around, like the EcoTrust in Portland. Uh, they have some lead buildings. They're downtown, but the, the, and, and they're fixing up old buildings and they're putting green roofs on their buildings. But the real story about EcoTrust really gets into the fact that they're helping create businesses that are doing well for the planet and doing well economically. And so they're helping both uh, uh, nonprofits and for-profits become more successful and bringing them together and helping them and helping them think about a framework like the social, the natural, and the economic issues and how all those go together. You know, our best businesses today and in the future, and especially in the future, are not just the bottom line. It's the triple bottom line. They are thinking socially, environmentally, and economically. And we have places here. Um, I think I saw uh, Ali from New Belgium. Uh, I like to hold uh, New Belgium up because of you guys have been looking at the triple bottom line for a long time, and you, you realize that when you do well with the social bottom line, your economic bottom line does better. If you do well with the environmental line, your economic bottom line, and vice versa, all, all of those go together. And so I think the most progressive businesses in the future are going to keep realizing that. And a place like the EcoTrust helps us realize those things. Okay, so now I'm, I'm really here to heighten your interest and awareness of this thing called biomimicry. It's a created word and a created concept, but it's one that's been waiting around for millions of years to be coined by humans. I think there's other species on the world who've been waiting for us to say, be more like us. Have you ever read Daniel Quinn? He wrote Ishmael and the story of B. So I've just given you now three books. I'm a teacher, I'm telling you, he has some homework. Three books. I first told you Hot, Flat, and Crowded, and now I'm telling you Ishmael and Story of B. If you read the, either of those last two, Daniel Quinn emphasizes the fact that we need to listen more to the other species, and we can learn some things from them. And he does that in a, in a great way. I mean, I felt like, oh, um, yeah, I know, I, sh I shouldn't be doing those things. But I learned a lot, and I, it changed my way of thinking. I think about those other species a lot. And that's what Jeanine Benyus has us do. She says, let's look at nature, let's ask nature, and let's figure out what we can do differently when we ask nature. So here's Janine and Dana. Uh, Dana, they work together, but they've created a great cadre of uh, uh, workers in a biomimicry institute, and now uh, there's many people who are sort of uh, disciples out taking the idea and learning more about it and spinning it and, and trying it in different ways. So let me get more specific uh, with you. So they are finding that we could reinvent the way we do things if we first thought about nature and said, how does nature do that? And to do this, you got to start with nature's principles. Now, Daniel Quinn did the same thing with me. When, when I read Story of Bee, he highlighted a number of nature's laws, he called them. And I started writing them down going, I never really have given enough thought to nature's laws. This could be a new part of the rest of my life is thinking more about nature's laws. He pointed out that there's still laws that are out there that we don't know about yet. And he gave us the example of uh, aerodynamics. Like how long have we understood the laws of aerodynamics? How long have humans been on this place, and how long have we known about the laws of, of aerodynamics? 
So when you think about it that way, you go, okay, well, I, I'm going to pay attention. There are some other laws that either I don't know enough about or we don't know en enough about. And so Janine lists these out and says, these are the laws that we should run by, we should pay attention to. And she gives a good examples of businesses that are doing that sort of thing. They're, they're paying attention to nature's laws. Um, if you go to their uh, website, and I encourage you to go to biomimicry.org, um, they have these life principles. Hard for you mm -hmm. to see any of these uh, right now, but they're basically uh, common sense things that you could use as core values for uh, a business or core values for an initiative or a project. Um, and the one right in the middle is the one I'm going to emphasize for you um, as I take you through the rest of this uh, lecture. I love the way Janine says, create conditions conducive to life. And that's what life does. Life creates conditions conducive to life. Let that digest for just a moment and think about what that's saying. Or think of examples where, yeah, life is creating a condition conducive to life. You know, this is all about what? About health and growth and rejuvenation, regeneration, abundance. It's a different mindset than we often work at. And so think about, keep this, that thought in mind as you leave today, but also uh, as I take you through the rest of uh, my lecture. Janine also points out that na nature has masterpieces. And these are things for us to learn more from, kind of check ourselves, like do, do we understand the laws or, or the processes? How does photosynthesis work anyway? And how could that matter to me? Uh, Janine has inspired a business in San Francisco, a solar business, to do things differently. They are in the midst of creating leaves. They're creating solar panels. No, they're creating solar objects that are trying to mimic nature, not a large rectangle created by people in white coats uh, in a lab, in a building without windows, but instead to create something like a leaf. And maybe they can be put together, so there's a number of leaves together and it could kind of look like a panel so it fits on the building the way we're used to, or maybe they could be in different ways. And then not just to mimic like it looks like a leaf, but how does a leaf work? How does a tree work? So thinking about how electricity could flow more like photosynthesis flows. That's mimicking the ideas of nature. That's what uh, Janine would have us do. So let me give you some specifics. It's pretty cool. She, she looks around at nature and says, how, how does nature do these things? So look at this abalone shell. It's a little bit hard for you to see. There's two different images. The one on the top right is a cross section. And what they point out is that this is calcium carbonate. And it's a pretty nice looking brick sort of pattern. And there's a, uh, a mortar that sort of key is keeping it all together. So she, you know, she's helping us use some building terms that we're familiar with. But if you start to research and analyze how the abalone works, read at the bottom, electrically charged framework, a crystalline inner shell twice as tough as ceramics, accomplished at a temperature, in ambient temperature water with zero waste. So she right there is saying, wait, maybe we can manufacture things differently. If we would pay attention to how, in this case, an abalone creates their shell. How do they do that? How do they self-assemble? How do they do it in cold water temperatures? How do they do it without blasts of heat? How do they do it without bringing in other polymers? 
how do they're creating calcium carbonate? I mean, so some materials, some some science, some chemistry that we're familiar with, but they're creating some proteins and carbons and carbonates and other things. So her point is, wait, maybe we could kind of all work together and figure some things out. I don't know everything about how this works, but maybe there's somebody else who ha is more of a biologist or has some other kind of chemistry background or has some other kind of, hmm, I wonder how I could create something because I know enough about chemistry that I could create something different. So she's asking us to think about what some mimic nature, not just to imitate, but to mimic it and come up with something that is less harmful, creating conditions that are conducive to life, which is not something that we always do. Or check out the blue mussel. The blue mussel, what's amazing about a blue mussel, and, and these are, you, you can find these in a, you know, a lot of different uh, water systems, but th go up to uh, Cape Cod and think about the water temperature and think about the tides and picture yourself as a blue mussel and you're trying to survive. And you're underwater and you're looking, you gotta grab onto something. And so you figure out how to grab onto a rock or a dock post or something like that. And you're not only just trying to hold on, but you've got to grab some food at the same time. And so they have these tentacles that reach out while they're holding on to something. And they reach out and grab little, little bits within the water that they can to keep themselves going, to keep themselves alive. How do they do all of that? And, and so how, what's that adhesive that allows me to hold on while the tide's pulling me back and forth? So that's, that's the kind of mindset. It's fun, right? When I was little, I, I thought, well, OK, everything's already been invented. And now the rest of my life, I'll just get to use the stuff that's been invented. And I don't know if I thought that because they came out with a color TV. I don't remember when it was that I thought that. But, but Janine has convinced me that we, we haven't even started inventing things compared to what they're going to be. This is a whole different mindset, but it's pretty fun to think about. Um, and so guess what? Now there's a company that has seized this thought. It's called Pure Bond. They have a product called Pure Bond. It's winning some awards as, hey, this is what we're talking about. This is, this is biomimicry in action. And so the Biomimicry Institute is interested in creating teams where we have researchers, and we have innovators, and then we have the business people who say, I'll run with it. So they have Pure Bond, which is produced in low levels of heat. It's a uh, healthy adhesive that is mimicking the way that the blue muscle creates a protein, secretes a protein uh, that is that adhesive type material that allows them underwater at those low temperatures to create it and hold on. And so safe to use and, and it works uh, underwater as a marine adhesive. So here's the, here's the process, you know, get the, the research going, how does that happen, the science behind it, and then the innovation into it, and how could we do something like that, and then the business mind to say, and how do we make it work and make it work economically. Or she points out that the spider web is something we ought to pay attention to. Ask some questions about you know, that's beautiful. We enjoy looking at a spider web, although, you know, sometimes we don't because we think about what that's doing in our homes or around our homes or something. So we rid ourselves of them. But I try to go, wait, the spiders are good. They're, they're catching on to some other pests, and so they're, they're, they're helping us. But dig in a little bit and go into how are they creating this? And as you look down the left side, the, particularly the golden orb spider has been studied to say, wow, they have up to 100 feet of drag line that they're able to somehow manufacture. And they have six different kinds of silk that they're able to call on. What do they push a button and get that kind of silk out today? Uh, in the wind, that material is able to stretch itself and then pull itself right back. And when it gets cold, it doesn't get brittle. We have a lot to learn. 
So there are some great humans, and, and we have some great minds, um, but I think we should give credit to those other species and concentrate more on them and realize their brilliance. Give them some credit, learn from them. So biomimicry can be applied to a lot of different things. Uh, you might remember four years ago when we first watched, uh, not first watch, I guess we watched Michael Phelps in what was that, his third Olympics, he was in that building. Uh, and it was fun when they showed us those shots, it was like hard to figure out what that was. Well, the, the architect was trying to mimic soap bubbles by that. Janine would say that's sort of like the, the start of mimicking nature. Like they did it more of an aesthetic response, which is fun and attractive. But she said there's more to it than that. So, so she says, use nature as a, as a mentor and a measure and someone to really propel us to like dig in like we just did with the blue muscle and kind of say, how does that secretion, how does that protein work? Not just imitate the way it looks. So this is a business gathering, so I thought it'd be good to show you some connections between how biomimicry and business uh, can go together. Have you heard of the Interface Company? They've been inspiring a lot of other companies, not just because they do great floors and carpet tiles and things like that, but because of how they think. And this all started with their uh, former CEO, Ray Anderson, who read a book uh, about the death of birth. And he decided he was contributing to the death of or the extinction of, of species. This is back in 94, and he totally redesigned his company. It wasn't just him. They have 7,000 employees, and they're all thinking differently now. They're on what they call, describe the, the climb to mount sustainability. And that mountain has seven different faces to it. Uh, for instance, closing loops, or uh, using renewable energy, or a, n a number of different things that are on the faces, connecting with community. So kind of sub things. They don't just have a green team. All 7,000 people are part of the climb to mountain sustainability and they have all these different initiatives that fall within these seven faces. So you can see it's pretty big. I talked to their, one of their sustainability directors last week just to kind of say, where are you guys going? And she said, biomimicry is where we're heading. That's, we've been thinking about this for a long time, but we've connected with uh, biomimicry. So here's a, uh, a good example of a company that's doing that. You know about Nike. Did you know Nike it cares about biomimicry? Their, their research right now is looking at how they can do things differently, and they're pay at, paying attention to geckos and mussels and goats. You know, so can we learn from those other species and do things in a different way than we've been doing? And have you seen this paint? Maybe, you, uh, maybe you've used it. I grew up in, uh, in uh, southeastern Michigan, and you can say I'm sorry. Uh, it can be beautiful, but uh, there, it's surrounded by industry and brownfields and things like that, things that we, we did not treat the planet very well. There was a lot of people that said, we're cranking out automobiles, and that's all we're thinking about. And sometimes I wonder if that's what got them into the trouble that they're in, that they only thought about uh, producing automobiles. But I grew up in this little town, and uh, we could ride our bikes uh, to the river, and there's all these uh, swamps around it, and they were always like, don't touch it. Uh, some of it might be algae, but I have a feeling some of it's industrial pollution, and we know it was. Um, but somehow these lotus flowers would bloom out of them. Have you ever seen a lotus flower? They're huge and they're as brilliant white as can be, even in these awful scummy ponds that are polluted. They figure out a way to stay white. Well, there's, if you study them, 
you see that when water hits the petal of a lotus flower, it balls up right away. And there's just enough texture on the lotus flower that it slowly works its way down the petal and it pulls off dirt. So when it rains, it becomes clean in that way. Well, a company now, Lotus Sand Paint, has figured out how to uh, create the same sort of uh, texture uh, and chemistry that when water hits it, it will slow down and ball up and roll off and pull dirt off at the same time. So there's mimicking nature, and not just by looks, but that's really understanding how nature works in terms of the lotus flower. Different way of thinking, right? And fun to, to think this way. So lotus sand, uh, exterior house paint, self-cleaning effect of the flower petals. Or here's a company that has done some interesting things. So a cleaning company. And they said, you know, we are leaving, we're bringing in these huge drums of cleaning solvents. And if you read the side of them, you don't want to. Like, it, really, I'm putting, I'm cleaning, and I'm doing this, this is, this is gonna make it cleaner. And so they said, we could do something different. Let's, and they heard about biomimicry, so they said, let's start, let's redesign how we do things. And so uh, rather than degrade, they start looking at asking some questions. Like, how could we stop? Could we stop using bleach? It's not good in the long run, but how about the, our employees? It's, you know, getting them close. Is that healthy for them? It seems to be creating problems. So the, ask nature is kind of what they, they say. Uh, bio, biomimicry says ask nature. So they ask and they find 10 ways that nature rids blood, including the mosquito. Okay, so let yourself go. Just let yourself go. I don't like mosquitoes either, but let yourself go. How does nature take care of blood? Or what, how does it transport? Or how does it remove it? Well, there's probably better ways than mosquitoes. I'm, maybe I don't need to think. I can cross that one off. Okay, I thought of it. Now I'll go on. Uh, but maybe there's some other pulps and fibers if we start thinking that way that would draw it out in a in a healthier way than a bleach does. And so the company now is experimenting with three different methods and they're hoping to invent new bio-inspired products. Stay tuned. We're going to find some answers on that one. So the main point that I want to leave you with is, and, and Janine says it in a very simple way, two words, ask nature. Open yourself up and then just ask nature. How would nature do? Okay, so we got the green right over here, and so I'm. Mean, how would nature transport? You know, you can ask asknature.org. Go to asknature.org, and right up the top, this is, they've created this uh, nonprofit. They're bringing the science and the innovators and the business minds together. And, and you, it says, put in a verb. So you could put in a verb of uh, move, something like that. And how does nature move? It'll, it'll give you 10 to 15 different thoughts. And some of them will, it'll say, these people are exp researching this. These people have already come up with some, some pilot ideas. These people have already created a business related to this. So what I'm talking about now is happening. It's, I think it's, we're at the early stages, but it's happening. So just to, for fun, as we, as we end this, ask questions. So how does, and, and she's really good at making sure we're local in our thinking. So she will, as one of those life principles I showed you on that chart earlier, it's, it's really be local, really think locally. How does local plant communities, how do they, how do they function? How do local organisms build? Okay, so you know, thinking about how, and every year I've been admiring the paper wasps around our house lately. And I can't. By the time fall comes around, and they start to uh, disintegrate, and I find little little portions of their house, and I'll bring it to my students and say, "Is this cool?" Because each of those. They're not really circles, they're like octagons, and they're each perfect, and they fit 
I know the wasp fits in there just, how are they doing this? How are they doing it? Such a beautiful artistic pattern. And scientifically, how are they doing it? So that's what I'm talking about. Ask nature. How is water filtered here? How do they power themselves? How's that sunflower do what it does? I've always wondered that. How do they communicate? She talks about swarms. Like, have you ever seen a, a have you ever gone um, scuba diving or snorkeling and you see a bunch of fish come by and they all move at exactly the same time? Or a flock of birds, some birds will do the same thing, or bees, a swarm of bees. I'm not gonna get too close, but I, I do enjoy that. But how do they all know how to move at the same time? There's probably some people that know the answer to that, but it's just kind of fun to think about. It could lead us to some new ways of thinking. So as I said, asknature.org, and here's your fourth reading, is, is biomimicry. Janine, is, as you can tell, I admire her uh, and, and what they're doing. It's a, it's a great organization. And we have connected with them. You may have heard of our, our lenses work. We're kind of pushing the same way, thinking about how to go beyond today's sustainability into the future. So we've created this framework at our institute, and we're connecting with their frameworks in biomimicry to push beyond and ask the questions, how do we do something that is more than sustainable? How do we do something that's generous? Can we give back? Can we be generous as a species to other species? Can we be generous to the planet? And here's one, one example, just quickly. Uh, if you haven't, this is Cheyenne. Can you believe it? That is Cheyenne. <laughs> You're like, no way, Brian. Uh, it's not Cheyenne. Anybody been to this place? A couple of you. OK. Not enough of you. I am, I'm, OK, there's your, there's your field trip I'm assigning. <laughs> You need to go to Cheyenne, believe it or not. You go to the midst of their botanic gardens and you will lose yourself in the children's village and they want you to. It is a beautiful place. Uh, we had a hand, our institute had a hand in it making it lead platinum uh, and so our students got involved in it but uh, uh, the architect from Cheyenne and um, the uh, AECOM, formerly EDAW, uh, in Fort Collins. The landscape architects did a wonderful job there. So it's a building and grounds, and, and as you can see, beautiful little places behind that little door, that round door. That's the secret garden. But it's OK. You get to go in and kind of experience. There's, there's probably 15, 20 different places. It, it says, go ahead and get wet. There's a, there's a pond there. Go ahead and get wet, just not above the knees. I mean, that's their rule. Uh, that is a vertical axis wind turbine right there. And it has a readout that tells you how many kilowatts are being grown in that garden so the kids can learn about renewable energy. And you see other forms of it uh, on there as well. So just a, to me, that's a place that's not sustainable. It is regenerative or generous. It's giving to future generations. And I think we have a task to do and, and so it doesn't take long to take the idea of regeneration into what has happened around us and what will continue to happen likely in the future. How can we best deal with it? How can we think generously about our lands around us and make sure that we are prepared? How do we repair and restore? And then how do we think generously into the future about it? And I think if we pay attention to other species and how they respond, we can learn some things from that as well. <clears throat> so I've taken you through some, quickly, through some, some kind of depressing thought about hot, flat, and crowded. I talked about what we're doing today that's kind of cool and kind of green. And then I've tried to inspire you to think that there is a different future. And if we start asking the other questions and ask the other species about how to do things differently, who knows what we'll create? And I'll just end the way I started. We are in a great place in, in Fort Collins in Northern Colorado. And we can be, uh, we are a leader in so many ways. Our school districts, our businesses, our city, our university. Let's continue to evolve and grow and regenerate generous ideas for, for our species and other species for now and for all time. That sounds like a big charge. 
but we can do it. We, we have the ability, we have the connections. It takes a mindset to just look around and ask nature and say, maybe, maybe it's not the old way of doing things, it's the new way of doing things. So be generous, create conditions conducive to life. That's your charge. Okay, thank you.